Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. If you're a uh, father in the room, uh, happy Father's Day. We're glad you're here. And the Lord bless you for bringing your family here today because before it's Father's Day, it is the Lord's Day. So we honor him with that. And with that, we go to the Word of God. So can you please open up to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is a bit of book um, about the household of God, how we should function, how we should practice, how we should preach, who we should ordain into ministry. Uh, uh, The household of God is the church. Each local church should see themselves as a household of God, where He dwells with us by His Holy Spirit, transforming us. God is our Father in heaven over this family, and Jesus is the head of this household over the church, bringing order to it, commandments to it, and bringing about productivity to it for His Father. But we need to remember that every single person in the household of God, now I'll make a distinction, not just every person who has a body inside the walls of the church are in the true spiritual household of God. Uh, The true spiritual household of God are those who are saved, those who are going to heaven, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. That's those people. We're speaking of them. Everybody in the household of God uh, who are God's children, Jesus' brothers and sisters, saved by Him, We were all at one time enemies of God. We are now in his household and in his family, and there are blessings manifold to speak of there. But we were, from birth until our salvation, we started out as enemies. We were criminals against the Father's law. We were arsonists against the Father's house. We graffitied his laws. We broke his commandments. We despised his son. We murdered his son as a race. We... um, We were sinners and enemies of God, but in His grace and in His mercy, and here's the the goodness of the gospel of God, in His mercy and His grace, He turned enemies into children. He turned those who are far off, who are opposed to Him, He turned us into uh, the family members of God and the friends of God. Now we sit at His table, we enjoy His fellowship. And He did that by sending His Son, God the Son, into humanity to live as one of us with our flesh, with our uh, 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 inclinations and our weaknesses and our, our limitations, and yet free of sin so that he could earn for us the life we could never live. And then he died on the cross to pay for our sins, which we deserve to pay for in death and hell. And then he was resurrected gloriously and triumphantly and sits over a kingdom that will have no end. And he has, as it were, swung open the Father's household doors. And he calls out to the street and says, all enemies, all uh, opponents, all unrighteous, all sinners, all criminals, come into my father's house before judgment falls. Before he destroys all of his enemies at my return, before you die in, under God's wrath and in your sin and are judged, come to the Father's household, place your faith in me, you will become a member of his family, be adopted, and God will transform your life by his Holy Spirit to be a godly life. That's the gospel. That's the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's Today, that as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're now asking the question of all of us who have been saved from sin, added to God's family, we're being made by the Holy Spirit to willingly live a godly life. What does godliness look like? And today, part of the answer for that, the main answer for that, the main point that we're considering today is that godliness will have in our hearts and in our minds a contentment, a contentedness with our possessions. Godliness will change. Last week we were looking at how it changes how we relate to work and labor and your boss. This week we're asking how we should relate to money and income and wealth and possessions. Godliness, Paul says here in verse 5, which is our main uh, point for today, sorry, verse 6, our main point for today is this, that godliness has tremendous investment Well, godliness has a tremendous pay return in dividends. Godliness has great gain as long as you have a content heart. Godliness is gain for the contented soul. The contrast that Paul is going to set for us today is between the true Christian, the child of God in God's household, and the false teacher who is marked by covetousness and a whole string of other sins. So, so as we study, we're going to read a little bit about false teachers. Don't think, ah, this is a text about false teachers. Wrong. This is a text about covetousness and contentment. 
false teachers are just a tremendous example and a terrifying uh, uh, example at that as to what happens to the covetous. As if we allow covetousness to grow in our hearts, we will find ourselves numbered along with those false teachers. Everything Paul says in 1 Timothy, because remember in Ephesus, the false teachers had gotten into leadership. They'd gotten into the pastorate. They'd, they'd gotten into the congregation and they twisted how she did things. They changed the laws, changed the preaching, changed all that. To so everything that Paul has to command Timothy to do positively, he always has in the back of his mind those pesky false teachers who are going to ruin everything. So every commandment he says, he sort of puts on the, on the defense, on the polemical, on the attack against this other way of thinking. And today he's speaking about money. He's just spoken about work and working hard even if you have a, a slave-master relationship. And he's going to introduce the false teachers as those who despise this teaching about everyday godliness. Really, what he's setting up for us today is a comparison between the evil and the righteous. The covetous and the content. The ungodly and the godly. Now, some of you have gone to Marxist institutions called universities, and you want to say, yes, evil versus righteous. Yes, the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. It's the rich, unrighteous, evil capitalists who have money because they're evil. And it's us poor, nice, uh, 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 righteous, uh, good, impoverished people. We don't have much, and we are the good, and we need to overturn some of you are, maybe you are the opposite way, and you think, actually, I am a child of God of heaven, I am godly, I am righteous, I'm amazing, and I know that because I have money. I have Mercedes, count them, one, two, three, I have BMWs, I have a Lamborghini on back order, I am blessed of most high, righteousness is riches, and those pesky, impoverished people who don't have much are probably just worshipping demons, it's their fault. Like Jesus and Paul, the poor people, the evil people from history. Oh, the, the logic doesn't quite wear out, doesn't uh, work out, does it? Nonetheless, they, they think rich versus poor. The Bible doesn't think that way. The Bible thinks evil contrasted with righteous. And today, contextually, it's those who are content with what God has provided for you, content with what God has provided with you, satisfied with God's provisions, or the covetous who desire personal gain. For its own sake. We could use this analogy. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, it's just an analogy. It didn't really happen. But a uh, uh, grandfather, he's lived a long, godly, uh, wonderful life. And he's got multiple grandchildren. And grandma, grandma has to decide what she does with the registration and ownership of the 1958 F100 sky blue mint condition original engine truck. Whoo! As close as you can get to heaven on earth for an Aussie, right? There it is, the Ford truck, and she has the keys, and she's deciding what to do with it. This, this, was, this was granddad since he was 18. This was originally his, and, and she decides to give it to Hayden, right? The grandson with the, uh, to all offense intended here, uh, with the mullet and the bim, the bum bag thing that the kids wear, and, and Nike shoes, and, 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 and speakers that are just blaring loud as he goes on, the, on his scooter through the street. Right? That, that, that grandson is invited in, and she says, she hobbles over and grants him the keys. Says, here, grandfather would have wanted you to have these. And his question, his response is, I wonder how much I can get for this. Oh, I wonder what the going value on the market is for a 1958 Sky Blue original engine F100 truck. I wonder. What could I get with this is the question that proves he is unworthy to inherit it. The, the value of that truck is not what he can get for it. It is the fact that it was his grandfather's and it is a 1958 F100 truck. You know what to get me for my 40th birthday. You can all just start saving. You can scour eBay and find it. <clears throat> Uh, uh, the question, godliness sounds amazing, walking with God under his smile with the, with the spiritually enriched oracles of God. Wow, godliness sounds amazing. I wonder what we could get out of that. Is that too many people approach religion? Wow, walking with God. I wonder what the market share value is of that. 
False teachers think this way. Wow, look at the power of the Word of God, the historicity, the, the, the spirituality, the, the, the miraculous power of this thing uh, of all ages. I wonder how I can use this to leverage these sheep to give me money, cars, a jet, you know, so I don't have to fly with the demon-possessed people or the poor economy people, you and me. Uh, how, can I, how can I leverage this godliness, this Word of God, this Christianity, this dead Savior, this glorious... Tra- how can I u- utilize this for gain? Some people come into it on a lower level. They just sort of come into Christianity. I'm, I, I, I want to advance my life. I want to clean up my act. I want to uh, make some money for my family. I think Jesus has some good economical fiscal advice, and, and he's, the, he, he's the advisor I'm choosing. Godliness is not on offer for the sake of gain. Godliness is a blessing in itself that the children of God enjoy. So let's look at, at the two examples. He gives us the false teachers, and he gives us the children of God. Look at verse 3. Uh, I'll read it all, and then we'll come back to the beginning of verse 3. Actually, end of verse 2 says this. Teach and urge these things. The pastor's job is to teach, explain what Paul the apostle says, and then urge the people to obey. So teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit. And he understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and, con- and constant friction among those who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of great gain. But Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. May God bless his own word in our midst and to our growth and edification this morning. The example of false teachers here is just that. They are not uh, uh, the focus uh, as to what they're teaching and what they're doing. They are an example of what a covetous heart can become when it's covered with the veil of Christianity. They are the opposite spectrum. They are the end of the scales that we are told by Paul here to avoid. And we can see by his contrast about contentedness and satisfaction with God's provision that that is his main theme today. False teachers have false godliness. They have false contentment. They are very satisfied in the millions that God promises to give them. Very satisfied, very content, very humble in the three private jets that they have and the uh, promises that you've made to fund all of their holidays that that they made you swear by oath with your hand on the Bible. They're very content with all of that. They're such humble people. They have false godliness, false contentment, and therefore false gain that is no such thing. Paul identifies them as deviating, as divisive, and as devouring. These false teachers, look at verse 3. They differ, they're the te- if, they, if, if anyone teaches a differing doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching, he's saying that this is the marker of false teachers, that they deviate, they, they get creative, they come up with their own thoughts, they don't look at history and look at the other interpreters and what is the church taught and, and what, is, what does the Bible interpret itself as meaning, they sort of just, maybe they pop, pop a pill or inject something or they just go into the highfalutin pride and arrogance and they say, what does this word mean to me? And that it shall mean to the people. I can take it and twist it like putty and Play-Doh, and I'll make the Bible work for me. Their teaching differs from the delivered truth and doctrine. Everywhere Paul writes to pastors, Timothy and Titus, he has in mind, he uses language of a delivered truth. The teaching, the standard, the faith handed down. This is the language of the apostle that... Pastors, teachers, religious leaders, theologians are not inventing or coming up with anything. 
We are just passing on a baton of truth from one generation to the next. Here is what God has said, is what we are supposed to be saying as preachers. Not, here's what came to me in a vision last night. Here's what I dreamt of this morning. Yeah, you, you, the pastor opens up their sermon with, I was going to preach the Bible, but, but I just thought I'd share something on my heart that God sort of delivered to me last night. You get up, you run, you come back here. Why'd you leave? Why did you leave? We got Bible here. Don't want anything more. So the teachers are to be teaching in accord with the delivered standard of God's word and not differing, not deviating. Look at what he says they're deviating from. The sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, we say, okay, so the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. Is that, is that what he means? The stuff that Jesus said in his parables, veiled in mystery and sort of strange, confusing ways of saying, is that what he means, the words of Jesus Christ? What are the words of Jesus Christ in the New Testament? They are all of the New Testament. Jesus Christ uh, uh, spoke many words, only a short amount of them, John says, was, were ever written down for our edification. He went back up into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit for the express purpose of filling the 12 apostles to then speak, preach, and teach, and explain the mysteries that were not, uh, uh, therefore, uh, were, not, were not hitherto explained or known. That means that the apostolic writings, including the Gospels, the apostolic writings are the authority for the church. They are literally Christ words. They are not just about Christ. They are spoken by Christ through the apostles. That's what an apostle means. That, that, that's why I, I will often say God tells us through Paul. God wrote down and said through James. That's how I speak because that's the truth. God speaks through the apostolic writing. That, that's the doctrine of inspiration. Their pens are guided by the Holy Spirit and kept from error. It's, it's inerrant. The, you know, Paul says in, in Thessalonians, he speaks this way in Corinthians. He even says in 1 Corinthians 14, if anybody does not recognize my teaching, he is not recognized. Right? Right? Paul says, if you disagree with my conclusions, and that was one of the chapters with some very culturally insensitive, very unpopular teachings. And this is what he says. If you want to be spiritual, if you are contentious, if you think yourself authoritative, but you disagree with Paul, God doesn't call you his. Paul's the standard. The apostles' teachings in the New Testament are the standard. They don't invite criticism. They are the standard of criticism. So before you go to some club or, 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 or ministry or seminary or teaching or camp over the summer and have some guy who's educated well beyond his means with more letters behind his name than are in his brain, and he tells you things like, well, some of the things that Paul said are actually less inspired than the others. You know, and, and I know Paul said that, but Jesus actually said this. And if we take Jesus' words over Paul's words, then we come to another conclusion. Oh, yes, Paul said that, but he was in a danky prison. The water, the moisture was probably getting to him. We understand now that the better way for gender roles to occur is dot, dot, dot. You hear people say that. Don't hear how impressive. An amazing teaching. A new, a new theology. Oh, he explains everything difficult about that passage is actually just cultural. And basically, Jesus' words for us is just, you keep being you. You're fine. You're good, right? You hear that teaching. Don't just think, how interesting. Think, damned. Think, Paul sends this guy outside of the church. Think, they are deviating. That is not even the main point. The sermon, we've spent far too long here, but this always needs to be reminded to us. The words of Jesus Christ through the apostles are spoken from Jesus and with his authority just like the Old Testament prophets used to say, thus says the Lord, so the apostles wrote down, thus says the ascended Christ. So people deviate from the words of the Lord, and let's put ourselves back in context. They deviate from Jesus' teachings because of covetousness. That's where Paul is going in this passage. Right, we've said back in chapter 4 where Paul said it, heresy does not start in the mind where they get things wrong and make intellectual accidents. Heresy starts in the heart that loves sin and then bends Scripture to fit their crooked heart. That's where heresy starts. So he says they're deviating from the truth, or sometimes they'll have a, their website, right? The statement of faith will look fine. They'll seem to embrace one of the gold standard theological traditions, but then you look at their life, or the life of the church that they're leading, or the people who they are commanding, and that's where the rest of verse 3 says, or the teaching that accords with godliness. Now, false teachers deviate from that as well. And out of their life comes just 
unbelievable ways that they are deviating from the ethics and the clear commandments of the New Testament. And again, they have clever, modern, postmodern, uh, hermeneutical hoops that they jump through in order to arrive at, at that conclusion. But they are nothing more than deviating because of their discontentment. Paul says here in verse 4 that the person who does this, you're, right, remember the Ephesian context of 1 Timothy, their former pastors recently fired by, by Timothy, the delegate from Paul the Apostle. That's how sensitive and raw this wound is. Paul says, your ex-pastor, Hymenaeus and Alexander, are puffed up with conceit and understand no thing. Nothing. I looked at the Greek word and the meaning of it for nothing. It means nothing. He doesn't say, look, they're smart guys, they know a lot, but on a few tangential, to, you know, tertiary things, they, they just don't quite make pasta. No, they, they get nothing. They understand nothing. In their head is hot air originating from a lower organ in their body. They have no clue. This is very, very rude, the way that, like, even for their day, the way that Paul writes this, puffed up with conceit. The NEB Bible translation says, pompous ignoramus. I love that. Pompous, use it. You have, you, use it. Uh, it will do you well. Uh, pompous ignoramus. It reminds me of, of Martin Luther, who was well known for his scathing attacks, even in debates or letters against, some of you have read Luther and you're getting excited right now, against people like the, the Pope and his prelates and the Catholics or other heretics in the church at the time of the Reformation. Here's what, here's what Luther said, very much like Paul. He says, a natural donkey which carries sacks to the mill and eats thistles can judge you. He's talking to false teachers. Indeed, all creatures can. For a donkey knows that it is a donkey and not a cow. A stone knows that it is a stone. Water knows it is water. And so we could go through all the creatures. But you are a mad ass and do not know that you are asses. It's very good. Like Paul. Here he says another time. You are an excellent person. He's talking to a Catholic trying to defend the gospel. So... You can see where this is going. You are an excellent person, a skillful, clever person, versed in holy scripture as much as a cow is versed in the biology of a walnut tree or a pig knows how to play a harp. <laughs> when you see that in your Father's Day card, you read it a couple of times, you go, I think this is an insult. This, he's calling me clever, I don't think he means it. Paul means to degrade, deride, and degrade the reputation of these false teachers for their deviations. They are pompous ignoramuses. Here's the second thing they do. They divide. They deviate from the standard of teaching and behavior. They also divide the church. Uh, in verse 3, Paul uses the language of sound words. You can see it there in your Bible. They deviate from the sound words of our Lord. In verse 4, he says, this false teacher has an unhealthy craving for controversy. This word unhealthy is actually the opposite of the word sound. The word unsound in Old English and the Greek word in this passage means unhealthy. Really, it just means uh, the healthy words of Jesus and the unhealthy craving of this false teacher. And basically the idea that Paul has is, and he loves using that phrase throughout the pastoral epistles, sound words, sound words, sound teaching. And he means healthy teaching. He means like a diet that comes into the soul and produces healthy blood, you know, a vitality in the body. The, the limbs work together. There's not antioxidants and swelling and inflammation and blindness and blurred vision. It doesn't produce that. It produces vitality, hard work. Uh, lethargy is done away with clear-minded, clear thinking. There's plenty of energy to work and produce for God's glory. That's what the teaching of Jesus does to the church. Binds them together, grows them up for productivity. Unhealthy teaching or unsound teachers produce kind of a, a, a disease in the bones, a, a disease in the blood that just spreads to every part of the body. And, and, and he says here, he'll go on to say, he has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind. Paul's saying, these guys who deviate from the truth and deviate from Christ's teachings on behavior, they also have this divisive effect on the church. They just, you know, some people have conditions which set their body parts at odds against each other. You know, you know immune system problems where, where the immune system will attack the heart and try and eat itself. See its own liver as a foreign body and trying to destroy it. 
That's unsoundness, and some churches are like that. Some people through uh, in some kind of uh, process towards psychosis, maybe it's mental, maybe it's aided by certain uh, 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 drugs or something like that, people can become uh, 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 elevated to such a level of psychosis, they look at their body and see things that need to be removed. And they just start chopping off limbs. I've read of such case studies over the years. People see their leg, believe it to be poisonous, perfectly healthy, and just start hacking and chopping it off. And what a sight for the, for the uh, paramedics to stumble upon. Uh, some teachers are so unsound and, and corrupted in mind that they just love to divide the church. They just love setting people up against the faithful teachers of history. They love setting the church up against the apostles. They love setting people against each other. They love the fight. And, and it's not so much that they love truth and they'll fight for truth. It's that they love the anger. They love the controversy that embroils around a pursuit of truth. So often like a red flag at a bull show, they will take truth and they'll know that Christians care about truth and they'll just use that flag to get Christians angry. Get Christians dissenting. Get Christians fighting and debating because they're so obsessed about individual words and the minutia of doctrine that is not actually good for the church. Some teachers are like this. Ultimately, again, we've seen because they want gain. Sometimes the most gainful thing, the most productive thing you can do to get people on your side is to get them off everyone else's side. They all hate each other but all worship you. You have a hundred faithful disciples. This is what some false teachers do. So deviating from the truth, dividing the church, and lastly we'll see that they are devouring. And we see this in verse 6. Where Paul has said that they do all this, and they, sorry, verse 5, and they imagine, depraved in mind, deprived in truth, morally and intellectually empty, depraved in mind, deprived in truth, they imagine, right? Paul's trying to set this up as a hilarious punchline. Like this is the height of idiocy. You climbed to the Mount Everest of stupidity and these guys were floating above it and here's what they say, that godliness is how you make money. Cue laughter, right? Everybody mocking this silly idea. But maybe that church, like many in our day, had actually imbibed that idea and couldn't quite see the joke. Is, is godliness not a pathway to earthly glory and income and wealth and possessions? Is, is that not it? Paul has to then warn the people, warn Timothy against the example of the teachers, which is so easy to fall into. These men devour, verse 5 says. Verse 9 goes on to say, but those who desire to be rich... He's talking about those who have, a, who have a desire to consume everything they can see and worlds beyond. So that when they speak of godliness, again, they ask the question, I wonder what I can get out of that. I wonder how I can leverage the words of God in order to make myself money, power, get myself position. Calvin says it like this. They think that the oracles of the Holy Spirit has been recorded with no other design than to serve the purposes of their covetousness. They traffic the word of God as merchandise exposed to sale. In other passages of scripture, Paul will say that their God is their belly. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says that he who loves money never has enough. Jesus said, that you cannot serve two masters, God and money. One's going to win out and be used for the other people. Either you love and worship and serve God and use money to do it, or you love and worship and serve money and you use God to get it. Paul says, uh, Peter even says in 2 Peter, that false teachers like this have their hearts trained in greed. Is amazing. These are the pastors who get into ministry in order to try and uh, uh, build their portfolio and, and build their wealth and fleece the flock. And just every second sermon is on how you should be giving more and more to your pastor. And God's, God's uh, 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 mercy to us is always monetary. And sow your seed into my ministry. Maybe some of you can recall that from your past. Or you are sinfully and greedily still guilty of that sin of trying to get rich quick by putting God in your debt, by donating to some online ministry that way. 
Sometimes this is the pastor who got into ministry because he heard that you don't have to do any heavy labor. You only work once a week and people buy your coffees. Plenty of those guys floating around. Sometimes this is the ministers who leverage the word of God to make the people tow the government's party line and get grants and payouts. Oh, we could look at all sorts of examples of the registered government-funded churches in communism. Or we could look at our own day and age here. I I know firsthand of a church that commanded its people that at our evangelism event this weekend, do not share the gospel. Because we got government grants for this event, and one of the conditions was we don't preach Jesus. Agreed? (laughs) Literally selling Jesus for money. Or the churches who, I don't know whether you know this, I'll open the bag on this one a little bit. During the COVID years, churches could have all of their staff members' uh, incomes met by the government in free donations so long as they were, you know, toeing the line, obeying the COVID rules and and not breaking or questioning any of those, right? HRBC uh, received zero dollars because that's perjury, right? (laughs) In my books, that's usury. They... But I knew of another church who received over $200,000 worth of payments. Just for, you know, just get vaccinated, sign in over there. There's a QR code here. If you can just all sit apart, you're not allowed here, there, everywhere. Obey the government. Twisted scriptures, love your neighbor. There are pastors who will compromise because, because there's people in the church who give a lot and they know their doctrines and they don't want to upset them. You don't want a pastor who loves money. He will lead you down a path of destruction. This is... The followers, whether they be in a cult, following a ministry, going to conferences, doing online uh, uh, sowings of seeds, or going to a church, this is those followers, those people who go and come to God because they were promised healing. Ah, that's very understandable, isn't it? Promised healing if you come to Jesus. Promised wealth. Promised financial prosperity. But those people, not just the leaders... Of course, it's the leaders too, but all of the followers there, they're not victims, and we shouldn't think of them as that. They are victims of their own greed. They are there. Maybe this was you in the past. I I praise God that you're no longer there. But they are acting out of greed, desiring to receive more and utilize God and leverage God into their debt. Verse 9 tells us the effect of this sort of thing. Those who love money and use God, here's what it looks like. Verse 9. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. It's very, it's very graphic, that imagery, isn't it? Somebody's, somebody's racing forward to try and grab at financial prosperity. They sat every uh, night before they went to bed. They said their recitations and their affirmations to themselves about becoming a millionaire, about being worthy. They put their truth out into the universe and expected a return. They got up in the morning and they read their meditations in front of the mirror. They did their yoga. They imaged and they professed and they claimed riches for themselves. Maybe this is some Christians who have a sort of slightly baptized version of all that. You get up, you read a book by some guy with shiny white teeth, tells you to say these things and God will give you money. Give this much to these accounts and God will give you money. Tithe this much and God will give you money. They desire to be rich. And as they're chasing after this riches, this goal, this I want to be this rich by this age or be in this position by this time in my life, and it's just a pursuit of theirs, and they they don't see that in front of them is is a gaping pit with spikes beneath them that you can't get out of. And by pursuing that, there is a snare that will snatch them and drop them in the pit. By grabbing the bait, they will be hooked into snares and harmful and senseless desires, Paul says here. This is sometimes that the pursuit of wealth becomes self-destructive in and of itself. People have enormous amounts of debts, credit cards to pay off. Or they jump into gambling or pyramid schemes in the hope of get rich quick. They sign all sorts of contracts they can't pay off or they are trapped in a lifestyle that they cannot escape. Sometimes people are a little bit more successful and they're getting themselves opportunities and capacities, but the very pace of that lifestyle and the pressure put upon them actually crushes them. Some people become so covetous, but they have not in their hand and the lack of their possessions burns them within. Maybe they, they reach out and they, they, they decide to steal and then they get caught. 
maybe they avoid taxes and then they get found out and jailed. Maybe through their covetousness and burnings for possessions, they recruit illegal help from the rabble and find themselves embroiled with illegal gang behavior. Or like Judas, and this is the painful reality that is by no means merely hyperbole, but the reality that like Judas, the burning desire for gold with the empty pockets and the empty hands and the empty wallets drives people to no other extremity than mere suicide. They kill themselves in hopelessness because they had their life, their worth, their soul set upon that which could not satisfy and did not come. Paul warns then against all of this about the false teacher or anyone who would become like them that the root of all of this was discontentedness. It's often... uh, the diagnosis that the scriptures make is often different to what we would think, right? He says, he, look at the life of the false teacher. Look at the life of the person going and ending themselves or being embroiled or having a destroyed reputation because of all these things happening to them. And he gets to the heart of it and says, it's because they want more. We just wouldn't think that. But here is God's wisdom telling it so. So then we can look at not just, not just the, the warning of what to not be like, but then Paul actually gives us very sound, very balanced, very bare minimum philosophy of Christian wealth. Here's where he starts out. Verse 6, we'll remind ourselves, godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen, someone. We'll explain why soon. You'll be able to amen at the end of the sermon even more. But godliness with contentment is great gain because Paul said so and he speaks for Jesus. But in verse 7, he sort of works out a fairly helpful foundation. And then in verse 8, he sort of gives us a fence line. (laughs) And it's very bare minimum. Here's what Paul says in verse 7. This is why godliness with contentment is gained. We are content because we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. This is the corrective. Now, you may have a lot of money. You may have very little money. You may have a lot of possessions and four storage units full of garbage. You may have very little. You're just starting your life out. You're a minimalist. You know, you read that book, uh, uh, just a plant and a single espresso cup sparks joy. That's all you got to your name. That's fine. All of us need to start, clear the table and restart our thinking of wealth and possessions and what we want and what we desire and our ambitions with this foundation. Paul says, we will be content with very little. Here's why. Because we came into the world with nothing to our name. You came in without clothes on your back. You came in naked. And you will leave this world naked. Now, I know we dress ourselves up for a coffin when we go into the grave. But we don't take that beyond the grave. That's just for the people on this side. So we come into the world naked, impoverished. We leave the world naked. We can gain some things. But all of our worldly possessions cannot go with us beyond that last stage of nudity. We either lose them as the dirt is thrown upon our grave, or we lose them at some point beforehand. Everything you've ever owned is untakeable with you. Everything you've ever touched or seen cannot come with you beyond the grave, but there is a list of things which you can take. Those are the things we should focus on, the things that, can ta- that we can take with us into heaven, into the next life. We should not focus on things that we held for a mere breath, the psalm calls our life. Psalm 39, go home and read it. A mere breath, a mist in the morning amongst an entire cloud of mists. That's your life. It's here, it's gone. A hand breath, that's all it is. And in that tiny span of life, we hold for a few seconds some things of great worth, then we're naked again and we die. Okay? It's as if this morning I brought in a, a bar of, of a billion dollars worth of gold, and I don't know how we would carry it, but anyway, the, the analogy goes, I walk up to you, I let you hold it for about 10 seconds, you, oh, it feels, feels very good, wow, how amazing. Then I take it back, say, how'd that feel? You're a billionaire for like 10 seconds. That's as worthless as our possessions in this life. You hold it for a tiny bit longer, it's called your whole life, and then, then it is over, and it's gone, and it's out of your hands again, and somebody else is going to grab it. Our lives are so short, possessions are so useless and meaningless. Paul says, you came in naked, you leave naked. Let's see what that affects next. Then he says, for, oh, sorry, but, in verse 8, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. When you start with nothing and naked, anything is gain, right? Anything is literally, technically, profit. 
So he says, if I came in naked, I'm going to leave naked, and in between here, I have enough threads to put together to cover me so that I don't get arrested, and I have enough food to get by so that the nutrients are met day by day and I'm not dead. If I'm serving God and that's all I have, I'm content because I still have more than I was born with. And remember, since I was born a sinner, I have much more than I deserve. I'm in a pretty good state. Anybody want to... Anyone want to amen that? Just the simplicity of life that that would exemplify for us. No, no contracts, no bills. If I just had a loincloth, something for the top. Uh, now, the word of, shel- uh, word of clothing in the Greek can technically also spread to the idea of shelter. Right? But a bus seat can be shelter, so you're not promised a home here. It's food, crumbs, it could be, just to get you through the day. It's uh, clothing, just enough to cover the essential bits. And it is shade of some kind, which maybe just a tree is casting upon you. That's all that God has promised. And Paul says, if you've got that, Christian, I want you to think, if that is all you had, but you knew that you were smack bang in the middle of God's will, you were serving him in your life. You were under his smile. You were living in godliness and you had threads and crumbs. Would you be satisfied? We all want to say yes. We all want to say yes. But the test is what we pray for. How do you pray to God? What's the, what's the process of your asking God for more? Because I want to make this caveat that Paul is not saying threads and crumbs is the, uh, is the maximum that a Christian should have. He's not saying that you should not own more than this. He's simply saying, if you have more than this, don't demand anything else from God. That is, that Jesus promised in Matthew 6, you will have food and clothing as long as you serve God and you're being obedient. God God promises you food and clothing. The rest, who knows? Now you might have it for a moment, then it's God the next day, but you will have food and clothing. That means if you're going to bed and you are certain that you are going to die before before you wake up in the morning from starvation, or you are lying naked without clothes to put on yourself, or you have no shade over your head, then and only then, but I do encourage you, then and only then you can call out to God and say, Father of all, God who feeds the lions and the deer and the fish and the spiders, you have neglected me this day, and you owe me something you promised. And in that moment, a miraculous thing will occur. Either somebody will pop into the, you don't have a room, onto your street or alley and give you some or something will drop from heaven because God cannot break his promises. But just as a clue, there's never been a Christian in that situation in all of history because God makes promises and he doesn't break them. Now, that sets up for us a bit of context. If then I have some food or a friend with food, remember, because they're told to be generous. And if I have enough clothing to cover me and my children and enough protection from the shade, maybe just from the building there, to keep the sun off my head, then I have nothing more to demand of God and my immediate posture should be of deep gratitude. Deep gratitude. Thank you, Lord. I have so much more than when I was born. I have so much more than I require and every other possession that we have should be marked off not only as an above and beyond blessing, and it should be, but also a possible temptation. Everything we own above a few threads and some crumbs becomes for us a possible snare into temptation, worldliness, and covetousness. That's why verse 10 says it this way. The love of money, it doesn't say money, money's not the root of all evil. The love of money is a root, not the root, it's not the only root. But the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. There's that suicidal imagery again. So, so, so what Paul is commanding us to remember is that possessions are an enormous blessing so long as we can utilize them for the sake of gain of things we can take beyond this world. Otherwise, possessions in and of themselves, if they are not improved upon for spiritual eternal benefit, they are a judgment upon us. Every cent you have and I have, every car we have, every piece of clothing we have, which is above the absolute essential, we will be giving an account to God for it and he will ask us, how did my kingdom, how did your neighbor benefit from this gift? And if we have nothing to show, then it will be racked up as a debt upon us, as a, as a warning, as a, as, as a rebuke upon us on the day of great accountability when we see Jesus. 
to everything we own is a potential risk, is a potential sin, is a potential loss of reward unless it is used, and hear me, it can be used. Great wealth and many possessions can be used for the kingdom in amazing ways. Don't hear any kind of pietism that says making a lot of money is evil or owning more than one dress, ladies, is a sin. Men own more than one shirt, suggestion, but you don't need to. Just say it's not sin if you let your wife buy your buy you another polo shirt. It would be okay. Anyway, moving on. He says that the desire to, the, the temptations come with the desire to be rich and the love of money. In other words, the love of money is this huge highway. And through that, that gateway checkpoint into your life could come any kind of, te- like think of any sin. Think of sins that you would simply never commit. Like mate, let's assume for most of it, genocide is up there. Like, I would never do that. I'd kill a couple. I'd be thrown, you know, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't, but a whole people group? Like, you think, and I think, we'd never know. Every sinner has a price, so long as they are discontented. Any sin for a price, if you are discontent. Therefore, to close that bridge, to shut that door, to, to, to cancel off that highway and close that road off into your heart, if you can close off the love of money, you have saved yourself an uncountable number of temptations which could destroy you. Sometimes the reason, and let's be really honest, some of us are poorer than we wish. We work hard and we're godly and we do give to the church. And we're generous to others and we're trying not to accumulate possessions. Jesus says life is not consist of, of one's uh, possessions. And you tra- and, but, but you are struggling. Now, let me empathize with you for a moment. It, yes, Christians can really, really struggle. And out of all the godliness in their heart, they, they don't want too much. But God, wouldn't a little bit more help me glorify him more, right? So you pray and you ask for a bit. But not that I owe it, Lord. You don't owe it to me. I'm not naked. And I'm, you know, I have food to eat. I, I don't owe, you don't owe me, but, but Lord, it would be good. And maybe you sort of struggle with the why doesn't he answer it? I'm sure, I'm, I know I'm in his will right now. I'm being godly, clean conscience. Sometimes the reason God doesn't answer our prayers for more is because he's answering our other prayer when we said, please, Lord, lead me not into temptation. And we know we're being godly now and we're just asking for some more, but only he knows whether we will be godly once we have more. Because more riches bring more temptations. More riches bring more accountability. And only God knows what we are ready and what we are uh, uh, sufficient for. So here's... A few ways that godliness is gain, as we close out. Godliness is gain if you have a contented heart Christian. The first way that godliness is gain, the first gain or benefit or dividend paid into your life from godliness is godliness. Just the joy of knowing that you walk with your father in the cool of the day. Just knowing that you are in God's hand, you are not under his frown, you don't have hidden sin, you are walking with him, obeying him, and and all known sin you bring to him at the end of each day, and you read his word and you feast upon it, and you can come home to a shack and 17 housemates, or a mansion and 17 Lamborghinis, but the wholeness, the essence, the substance of Christian joy is that I am being godly. There is such a deep joy in a clean conscience that so few people have. Only Christians have it, but not even all Christians have it. The joy of being able to put your head on your pillow at night, thank the Lord for his blessings, know that you have done your darndest that day to walk in his will and go to sleep, not not, not fearing death or not fearing waking. It is such a rare thing. The Puritans used to say, a clean conscience doubles every joy. Every joy is doubled when you know you're under God's smile. So godliness is its own reward. Secondly, though, we have the blessing or the gain of unwasted wealth. If the ultra-spiritual type, this will feel too earthy, too worldly. But it's true. It's in the scriptures. That when we are godly with our behavior and our ethics and our teaching and our beliefs and our life and our hearts, when we are godly, we will not find at the end of every month Money just burned and melting away in stupid pursuits. 
You know, a third of our money on alcohol, another quarter of it on cigarettes, another half of it on the gambling, another 40% of it on the keynote. I don't even know how the maths are going at the moment. And, and the last 10% of it, you know, put into the, uh, into the uh, footy tipping in hope of winning it big this week in the office. You don't burn wealth like that because you're godly, you're content. Getting rich quick is the promise of the devil, not the Lord. And so you are satisfied. The third thing, very closely related to that, is the steady growth of savings and wealth. That is that you are not promised if you are godly, you will get rich quick. You're not even promised you'll get rich. But you are promised, and, and the scripture bears this out, that those who are godly know not to waste, and therefore it may be decades at a time, really, before potential uh, uh, you know, income brackets are breached, and maybe work slow going, but Christians who are wise and balanced, they don't spend more than they make, they're not covetous or buying out of comparison with others. Those who are godly are able slowly, slowly, bit by bit, to get out of debt, to build some wealth, to, uh, 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 to, to, to get more money and more stability in steady growth. And of course, all of that is still subjected to maybe God sends an economical downturn or you get thieved. There's no promise against that. But, but in general, proverbially, Christians who are godly and content can grow their wealth more steadily and stably. Fourthly, that there is a gain in godliness in that God can look at your faithfulness with the little and bless you with more so that you can be faithful with more. Jesus speaks to this in Luke 16 and he says, those who are faithful in little are faithful in much. Those who are unfaithful with the little will be faithless with much. That means if you're content and you don't want more and you're okay with what God gives and you're serving Jesus and your godliness and your conscience is clean and then he gives more, you get to conclude, God, you have seen me as faithful and I can receive this blessing with thanksgiving and you will help me be faithful with it because it is a means to benefit the kingdom. So the blessing of godliness is that God gives you more to be a blessing with. It's closely related to the next one, which is generosity. God is a generous God. Our Father is a generous Father. He loves providing. He loves giving good gifts to His children. Chapter 4 and chapter 6 both say that God gives us everything for our enjoyment. And if we are godly like Him and He gives us more, even if it's a little bit more, we can use it and be generous with it. Even if we give away all the more, then we are more like God and godliness becomes its own blessing again. We also have this. Where there is godliness and contentment, whether rich or poor, there is a peacefulness, a peace in your friendships and family relationships. That is, that if, if you're not surrounded by the covetous because you want what they have and they want what you have, if you're not always trying to compete and, and one up in the rat race with all those around you, if you are content and those around you are content with the, even the little that you have, then the meals are sweeter, the relationships are more beautiful, you can enjoy what gifts of God God has given to each other, and you, don't, you are not constantly burning with covetous desire every time you go over to her house, see her kitchen with the island bench with the marble top that you liked, and a little push-out laundry thing that does all of its own washing. Right? Am I speaking anyone's language? Maybe it's Dad's Father's Day, right? Uh, he's got the Chevy. He's got the Ram Dodge. He's got the, the self-driving uh, a, a lawnmower. And you see all that and you go, good on him. Praise God. I still push my powerless little wheel thing needs more grease on it lawnmower. I do my trimming with scissors, but I'm good. The Lord, the Lord is gracious. I've got more than a thread and a crumb. I'm satisfied. Your relationships are redefined. Proverbs 17 verse 1 says, Better is dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Some people have a lot of feasting and a lot of cars and a lot of nice houses and all of their family hates them. Some guys are going to give millions to their grandchildren. Each grandchild is going to get millions from this guy's will and every one of them hate him. That's a horrible place for a Christian to be and we must not be there. We could say this also, a decrease in anxiety. And with a decrease in anxiety, how the health benefits would come. If cortisol was just a little bit lower in the average person, how many less stomach ulcers, all sorts of other problems would, would be eradicated. But not all anxiety, but much anxiety comes from covetousness. You want, you don't have, you worry. I wish, I wish, I wish, I don't see, you distrust God. 
If we could deal in contentedness, what I have, I have by God's ordination. What I don't have is his own decision. If I have it, I hope to be faithful with it. If I don't have it, I'll be faithful with what I've got. If you had that mindset and godliness, what contentedness and lack of anxiety you would have. Or as verse 10 told us, there is stability in your faith. Surely for the Christian, the risk of backsliding is the worst warning in the world. Paul says in verse 10, if you love money, you are at risk of wandering away from the faith and being pierced by yourself with many pangs. You know, maybe that's a picture of hell. Maybe it's a picture of suicide. Maybe it's a picture of getting yourself into a lifestyle that pierces and crushes you. But it's included with wandering away from the faith. You'll give up on Jesus because you love money so much. Stability in the faith is a blessing that comes with godliness and contentment. And lastly, eternal life. The fruit of godliness, the gain of godliness is eternal life. Because godliness starts not by us doing something or obeying anything. Remember what we said at the beginning? Godliness starts with God picking us up as enemies, washing us clean in the blood of Jesus and putting us in his household. The first step of godliness is faith in Jesus' cross who died and paid for all of our sins. So godliness and all true godliness will bring about eternal life in heaven because it is first and foremost faith in Jesus Christ. That means that if you want to be godly, you hear all of this stuff and you're worried about your eternal state, the command is not be godly and God will take you to heaven. Don't try that. That's not godliness. God despises that false godliness. The first thing you need to do is trust in Jesus Christ. Call on him to save you and forgive you. You'll be joined to his family and then the life transformation will start. Trust in him today. Be forgiven. Let's pray to our loving God. God and Father, we bless you and we thank you because every single one of us here has more than we need. We have so much, Lord God, and we ask that you would uh, not destroy our possessions, not eradicate our riches, but that you would make us faithful, godly, and content. Surely, Lord God, if we were content, there would would be certain things that we stop trying to invest in, or there would be certain practices that we repent of. If we were truly content and children of God and we were born again, there would be certain anxieties that we would not uh, entertain. There would be certain uh, 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 things that we would not pursue. So please change our lives and our hearts and our minds and our investments and our uh, uh, finances. Do all of that, Lord, but start. Do it all as a fruit of giving us contentedness in Jesus Christ. Make us satisfied to have him and may all the world pass away. If we have only Jesus, we are satisfied. Please, Lord God, give us this mentality. Make us faithful with what you give us and we look forward to seeing you face to face on that final day. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone said...